everyone, and welcome back to What the H Are You Reading? I'm your host, Brian Hines. And as always, we're going to be doing four quickie reviews, one for each week of the month of February. Let's dive right in with week one and Beast Wars number one from IDW Comics. Now, it's the 25th anniversary of the Beast Wars, the Transformers line that had its own CGI show by Mainframe, the studio that did one of my all-time favorite shows, Reboot. To celebrate, IDW has launched a new Beast Wars series written by Eric Burnham with art by John Burcham. However, while previous Beast War comics have followed on characters not seen on the TV show, this is a straight-up retelling of the Beast Wars TV series. And by straight-up, I mean different. How is it different? Well, right off the bat, we have two new characters who weren't on the TV show. Nil, a female Maximal pilot who turns into a bat, and Scold, a Predacon warrior whose beast mode is a snapping turtle. What effect these two have on the story, if any, has yet to be shown. This first episode is a prequel of sorts. We get... Megatron meeting with the Tripurticus Council to tell them of his plans to steal a golden disc and then transmit into a different space and time area so that he can learn its secrets. We then see his opposite, Optimus Primal, lamenting that he wants to make a difference in the universe even as he's stuck aboard a small research ship with a tiny crew. And by the end of the story, the Predacons and Maximals have had their initial encounter and wound up on a strange planet with two suns and assumed their beast modes. I don't want to spoil anything for anyone who hasn't seen the TV series. Uh, outside of Primal and Megatron, we really don't get much character development. More introductions to the cast that we'll be getting to know as we go forward. And I think perhaps the writer is relying too much on our knowledge of the Beast Wars TV show to fill in the blanks. Also, the art is very... awkward? It's very... Uh, the robot parts are very thin and flat and right angular, while the Beast modes are very kind of subdued and chunky in some cases. Uh, also, the cover price of this book is $6, so it's a little pricey. Now, I'm a huge Beast Wars fan, and I've enjoyed previous IDW Transformers books, so I'm going to keep with it, but this initial issue was a stumble out of the gate. Not the bold new series it needed to be to attract new readers outside of the nostalgia crowd, which obviously I'm a part of. Now for week two, it's Future State, Superman Wonder Woman number two. February sees the conclusion of the Future State event before the March relaunch slash soft reboot of all the ongoing titles. Uh, this first issue had Yara Fleor, the new Wonder Woman, teaming with the Earthbound Superman, a.k.a. John Kent. It has the two heroes confronting Kuwait, and I apologize if I'm pronouncing that incorrectly. The Brazilian sun god from Yara's pantheon goes up to fight a giant alien computer that's actually an artificial sun named Solaris. Superman and Yara have little luck breaking up the fracas, and then both have to try and de-escalate the situation by taking the two on separately. The first issue ending with Superman challenging... Solaris to a test of strength, and if he fails, Solaris gets to kill him. The second issue opens with Yara explaining that she challenged Kuwait to a race. This will distract him from Solaris, and hey, if he beats Wonder Woman, that will only make him more famous. But Yara sees how tired John is. He's stretching himself too thin, protecting the Earth and several other dimensions and planets. And since Solaris projects red solar energy, the kind that depowers Kryptonians, he's no match for that computer. So they make the only move they can. They split up and take on different opponents. John challenges Kuwait to a race, and since Superman would be an even more impressive victory than Wonder Woman, and he's kind of an egomaniac, he accepts. And Wonder Woman challenges Solaris to a test of strength, again with the caveat that if he wins, he will get to kill Superman. Using a radiation projector she borrowed from the Fortress of Solitude, she blasts Solaris with radiation that eventually makes him burn hotter, going from a red sun to a blue star. Once Solaris realizes it no longer has red solar radiation to depower Superman, it flees in terror. And Quake gets to the finish line, finding Superman waiting for him, having easily outpaced him. He goes to attack John in a fit of rage, but Superman just flies into the sun and punches the solar core, knocking out Kuwait, who is its godly avatar. Having used their strength to defeat their friend's enemies, Yara takes on some of John's responsibilities for the day so he can have a chance to relax, and the two share a breakfast at the Fortress of Solitude. Now, this is one of the few future states I read with no backup tales, so it relied entirely on this one story, written by Don Waters, with stylized art by Leila Del Duca. It's a fun little read with both heroes seemingly in an unwinnable position, but then winning by relying on the strengths of their friend. And while Yara just shooting a gun at a son to beat it might seem anticlimactic, she's actually out thinking it and preying upon its insecurities to get it to go away. And John, who usually likes to reason with his opponents, using his superhuman strength to actually knock one out was a fun change of pace. It's okay once in a while to beat up the bad guys, come on. The art is pretty good. Del Duce is really good at drawing people, but her animals and scenery could use a little more attention. 
Good read, not great, but there haven't been many even good reads in Future State, so take your wins where you get them. I really did like the friendship between Yara and John, and I hope we see more of that in the future going forward. For... I'm different. Actually, unfortunately, I lost the back half of this review, so I had to refilm everything a few days later, which is why this video is so late. Apologies. And for week three, it's MODOK number three. With the upcoming MODOK stop-motion cartoon series on Hulu, Marvel has decided to give the mental organism designed only for killing its own miniseries. Written by that show's creators, Jordan Bloom and Pam Oswald, who will also be voicing MODOK in the cartoon. And whereas in the cartoon, coming in May, MODOK has to balance being the leader of a terrorist organization, AIM, with married family life, in the comic book series, MODOK has no family. So why does he remember one? As he tries to understand where these memories are coming from, AIM turns on him, and he has to turn to Tony Stark, of all people, for help. Issue 3 opens with our favorite alternate universe mutant, Gwenpool, taking on an assassination contract to kill MODOK. Meanwhile, old mobile organism has ditched Stark and found the lab where he was created in South America, filled with MODOK-style test animals. Just giant heads with little spindly bodies. Gwen arrives in the two fight. Meanwhile, MODOK is having flashbacks of his life before being MODOK, when he was George Tarleton and he was forced by AIM to become MODOK, although he always remembered it as choosing to become MODOK. Gwen destroys MODOK, but then sees a mental projection of his family. Realizing he was becoming more human because of this, she uses her powers to step out of the comic book because she believes herself to be a comic book character. I know, it's crazy, right? And re-edits the comic book so he survives and gets access to those memories. Furthermore, the house in his dreams is actually real, and he's given an address. He leaves Gwen behind and heads to the house, only to find the founder there, none other than Alvin Tarleton, his father. The story is enjoyable here in as much as it's just a giant head with rage issues flying around trying to find out why it's having flashbacks to a sitcom style nuclear family. And the writers use Gwenpool to decent effect by having her break the fourth wall and explain to the readers that these memories are giving some emotional growth to Modoc and making him slightly less horrible. The art by Scott Hepburn is decent, it's comic book based, but given that this is based on an upcoming cartoon, maybe the art should have been more cartoony. Sadly, the MODOK comic book miniseries' biggest sin isn't that it's tied into a TV show nobody has seen yet, it's that it's about a C-list villain that nobody really cares about. It just all feels insignificant. On top of that, with Pam Oswald writing this book, I expected it to be a lot funnier, but maybe I'm just projecting too much expectation onto Patton. And finally for week four, it's Future State Suicide Squad number two. The first issue featured a Suicide Squad based on the Justice League, but still run by Amanda Waller. Also, that Superman was Connor Kent, the clone of Superman and Lex Luthor. Only by the end of the book did we find out that this is Earth-3, and the Suicide Squad that we know, run by Peacemaker, has come to bring Amanda Waller back to their Earth. It also featured a backup story of Black Adam at the end of the universe, now a peaceful man with no powers who's also knocked up Wonder Woman, so yeah, there you go. In the second issue, the main story, written by Robbie Thompson and drawn by Javier Fernandez, is all about the Justice League Squad taking on the true Suicide Squad of Peacemaker, Evil Star, a parademon, the cheetah, mirror master, and Lor Zod, the son of General Zod. Both teams more or less end up annihilating each other as Peacemaker finds out that the Amanda Waller they've been following is the Amanda Waller of Earth-3, who's been manipulated and blackmailed by the Amanda Waller of Earth-1, the one they're trying to take back. She ends up manipulating Connor into destroying a kill switch which actually seals Earth-3 off from the multiverse. She and Peacemaker die as anyone from Earth-1 cannot exist on that planet for long as the difference in multiverse vibrations ends up killing them. Thus Amanda Waller fulfills her desire to protect an Earth, although not her original Earth, by sealing it off from any threats outside the universe and leaving Superman behind as the sole metahuman on the planet to protect the humans. It's something of a nihilistic story that relies on the surprise factor of killing off its cast to tell the story. The double cross with the two Amanda Wallers was pretty good and I probably should have seen it coming, but I didn't. The art by Fernandez is okay. He's a little too reliant on speed lines and action scenes. Like there's someone going to throw a punch and instead of any background you just get the speed lines moving past him. That happens a lot in this comic and it's a little distracting at times. And the coloring by Alex Sinclair is not to my taste. It's a tad flat and dark. Now the Black Adam follow-up by Jeremy Adams with art by Fernanda Parison is actually a follow-up to the story in Future State Titans. Raven was taken into the Rock of Eternity by Shazam, but in the far future has become her father's daughter and is now a giant glowing black bird entity called the Unkindness that is destroying all of reality. A few hundred magicians are now hiding on the Rock of Eternity, hoping to wait out the destruction of reality so they can bring life and magic back to the universe. Unfortunately, the Unkindness and its army of demons do get through the Rock of Eternity's defenses and begin killing off the remaining magicians. 
The wizard Shazam repowers Black Adam and he destroys most of the invading army, but the unkindness is too powerful. A dying Shazam and Black Adam hurl the Rock of Eternity back in time and Adam finds himself trapped in the rock, which itself is trapped in hell. Adam promises to kill the unkindness before it starts, thus killing modern day Raven, so that he can one day return to the future and be reunited with Wonder Woman and their unborn child. Now this large comic was actually split in half, the first half being the Suicide Squad story, the second half being the Shazam story, and frankly, the second half is overwritten. There are a ton of new characters to keep track of, a ton of old characters making cameos that you're supposed to remember, and frankly, there's just too much going on for this short of a story. And also, they never explain that the unkindness is Raven. I only know that because I was leafing through the Future State Titans book and saw that she was taken into the Rock of Eternity by Shazam. Any reader who didn't read Future State Titans is just left to guess that on his own. Thankfully, the art by Fernando Parison is really crisp and precise, very detailed, great action scenes. And while I like the art in Black Adam, that in and of itself is the only real positive of the book, and that's not enough for me to make me want to recommend it to you. The Suicide Squad story was kind of a flop, but Black Adam is an iconic character, and I am interested to see this new status quo in the modern-day DC universe that's coming out after Future State launches. But at least Black Adam himself is an iconic character, and I'm interested to see his new status quo play out in the modern DC universe after Future State wraps up. All right, my friends, thank you for joining me for these quick reviews for the month of February 2021. Hey, do me a favor, like and subscribe to this channel, and I'll see you back here next month for quick reviews for March 2021. Until then, this is What the H Are You Reading, and I'm your host, Brian Hines.